On the morning of Monday, July 30th, 2018, I was taking my dog Rocky for a walk. Rocky is a decent sized dog. He's about 85 pounds, and he's a big mutt. He's about two years old, and I always joke, he's just as stubborn as his mother is. He likes to stop constantly during our walks, always sniffing around for something to lift his leg up on or something disgusting to roll in. Oftentimes, when he finds something he really wants to investigate, he'll square up and refuse to move an inch. It was on this morning, an overcast, humid Georgia morning, that we walked through our neighborhood. We live in a very suburban community, set back from any major roads. Still, there is a lot of coming and going in the early morning hours. Lots of people leaving for work, beginning to stir as the sun begins to rise. So, as I'm walking with Rocky, he stops for one of his prolonged sniffing breaks. We're on a street corner, preparing to cross, when I notice a loose sheet of paper taped up to the stop sign. I had somehow missed it, subconsciously thinking it was a garage sale notification or something like that. But it catches my eye. People who dabble in true crime storytelling, podcasters, authors, reporters, etc., won't tell you this. But there are certain words that catch our eye. Murdered. Vanished. Mystery. Missing. These words pop out at us. So on this cloudy, overcast, humid Georgia morning, as I'm walking my sweet, naive, ignorant mutt, having ingested zero coffee as of yet, I see this loose leaf sheet of paper. The word missing is displayed in big, blocky letters, set up against a black backdrop. On this sheet of paper, I see three pictures of a woman. Her name and characteristics are displayed just below. Andrea Pauline de Gelder, age 39, height 5 foot 6, weight 140 pounds, missing from Grovetown, Georgia, Columbia County. Last seen Wednesday, July 25th, leaving her shift at the Charlie Norwood VA Hospital. So, I take a picture of this missing persons flyer. I've lived in the community for roughly two years now. I've lived in this neighborhood in particular for about a year. This is the first missing persons flyer I've seen in this neighborhood. You hear it all the time, whenever a criminal case reaches the news broadcast. This never happens here. This is a nice community. This truly does never happen here. This is a pretty nice community. This is the area I take regular walks with my dog. This is the area where my wife goes jogging. This is the area we're both hoping to start a family. Now, I discover that a woman from our community has gone missing. I take a picture of the flyer, and it enters my long-term memory. I think nothing of it until later that evening, when my wife and I are in our upstairs office. Our cat, Bullwinkle, is doing something really goofy, and I try to take a picture of it. As I'm about to hit the button on my phone to take a picture, I see a tiny reminder in the bottom right of my phone screen of the last photo I took, the missing persons poster from earlier that day. I bring it up in conversation to my wife, telling her how creepy it is to have something like this happen so close to home. I often talk to her about the stories that I cover on this podcast, and it's usually always in other cities, other towns, sometimes even other countries. But this happened here, in the very neighborhood that we live in. As I will later learn, Andrea de Gelder lived just a few blocks away from my wife and I. She was a recently divorced mother of one, who had overcome adversity which reared its ugly head in the form of a debilitating illness. She had struggled through so much pain and suffering, and had begun to rebuild her life in this quaint little suburb on the outskirts of Augusta, Georgia. This is the story of Andrea de Gelder. Welcome to Unresolved. I am your host, Michael Whelan. If you can't tell by the odd personal nature of this episode's introduction, it's one that has struck really close to home for me. Quite literally. It's also an incredibly recent story, unfolding just over the last few weeks. This also happens to be the last episode of the season for Unresolved. So if you want to hear about my upcoming break and what's next for the podcast, just listen through to the close. However, before I continue on with the story of Andrea de Gelder, I just want to briefly pause and let you know how you can help support the show. Ratings and reviews on iTunes and Apple Podcasts are always appreciated, and they really do wonders for independent shows like this one. As I've said before, I don't have any help from a major network, and I don't have a team of writers and researchers working with me. So if you want to help support my endeavor to turn Unresolved into a regular weekly show and continue growing, those reviews would be a good way to start. 
It would only take about 30 seconds of your time, but it would do wonders for Unresolved and I would appreciate it so much. And of course, if you do want to go a step further and gain access to cool perks like commercial free episodes, bonus episodes, and more, consider heading to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod to become a patron. After all that, if you don't feel like supporting the show in any way, then I still appreciate you taking the time to listen. Thank you. Now, without any further ado, let's learn a bit more about the subject of today's episode. Andrea Pauline DeGarmo was born on March 23rd, 1979, a Friday, in Peoria, Illinois. Her parents were William and Donna DeGarmo, now Donna Morrison. Her mother would remarry, but Andrea would remain close to her siblings, Amy and Logan. Andrea grew up in Salisbury, Missouri, graduating from Salisbury High School in 1997. She then moved on to college. A few years later, in 2000, Andrea met a young man who would have a significant impact on the rest of her life. Ryan de Gelder was a member of the United States Navy, and the two fell in love, beginning a relationship that culminated in marriage in July of 2002. After marrying Ryan, Andrea moved out to California, where she would spend the next handful of years. The young couple originally lived in the San Diego area for about a year or so, before moving up to Central California. There, they would move around a little bit, moving from the San Francisco Bay Area to Seaside, just north of Monterey. Because of how difficult it can be to keep steady employment as a military spouse, Andrea struggled to maintain consistency. She had worked in the nursing field following her graduation from high school, and was able to obtain employment as a CRC and a CRA, a job title she would maintain for about 10 years, while the couple continued to move around the state of California. Eventually, in the mid to late 2000s, Andrea's husband received orders that moved them from California out to Georgia, a trek and culture shift that I have become personally familiar with. However, this stay in Georgia was short-lived as the couple was then moved out to Hawaii just a couple of years later. Ryan and Andrea de Gelder lived in Honolulu, and Andrea began working for the East-West Medical Research Institute as a research coordinator. She worked there from 2010 to 2011, with 2011 being the year that Andrea's life was changed forever. At the tail end of 2010, Andrea became pregnant with what would become her first and only child, Kellen. However, when she was just five months pregnant, she would become diagnosed with aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is a blood disorder where the body stops producing new blood cells. I won't pretend to be a medical expert, but this can lead to all kinds of side effects, and it's a very rare disease with an undetermined cause. The condition seemed to worsen throughout her pregnancy, but she gave birth to her son, Kellen, in March of 2011. Shortly thereafter, she started a blog titled Surviving Aplastic Anemia, which detailed her struggle to recover from this illness. Just months after giving birth, Andrea had to prepare for a number of treatments, including radiation therapy and chemotherapy, which led to a need for platelet transfusions. Thankfully, she was able to find a match for bone marrow, her brother, Logan, but she would have to go through a full, nightmarish treatment plan before that surgery could even take place. And even then, the road to recovery was going to be long and arduous. Andrea moved back to Missouri to be closer to her family and her chosen doctors. But because of her husband's military orders, he had to remain in Hawaii. He would come and visit whenever allowed, including a month-long stint as she readied for the bone marrow transplant. The aplastic anemia eventually led to an additional diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome, better abbreviated as MDS, which complicated things further. This additional diagnosis carried with it a five-year survival rate of 50 to 60% and a need for continued chemotherapy and similar treatments. While undergoing these treatments, Andrea was essentially quarantined. The aplastic anemia and other conditions that developed as a result gave her a very fragile immune system, and she essentially had to live in isolation for the time being. She could not risk being exposed to other airborne illnesses, and that meant that contact with her husband and even her newborn son, Kellen, were very limited. 
However, some good developed as a result of this hospitalization. Andrea's health scare had reinvigorated her interest in medical science, and she was looking beyond her limited timeline to graduate school. She began studying for the GRE, and was beginning to learn more about her illness, in the hopes of helping others like her. On July 27th, 2011, which just so happened to be Andrea and Ryan DeGelder's nine-year wedding anniversary, Andrea received her bone marrow transplant from her brother, Logan. The surgery went well, and what followed was a lengthy treatment program. For the next several months, Andrea went through a number of chemotherapy and radiation therapy programs, which brought on all kinds of side effects. Nausea, migraines, depression, sore throats, hair loss, the works. As Andrea detailed in her blog, the first month or two was absolute hell. But the following couple of months weren't that much better. She had to remain pretty isolated, and could only spend limited time with her own son, who was still less than a year old. She began missing out on many of his first moments because of this, and had to live a vicarious relationship with both him and her husband, who was an entire continent and ocean away. She kept up with her blog, surviving aplastic anemia, for the next six months or so, until the tide finally began to turn. Andrea continued her recovery from this disorder, and, soon enough, the threat of any setbacks began to disappear. The bone marrow transplant had gone as well as could be, and she was now looking forward to a happy life, free of at least this health issue. In the first half of 2012, Andrea stopped contributing to her blog, at around the same time that her family was reunited and moved to the Washington, D.C. area. Andrea was now living in Maryland, near Fort Meade, with her husband Ryan and her infant son, Kellen. Here she is in a Facebook video, finally getting to enjoy time with her son as he swings around on a playground. Kevin, are you having fun in your swing? Kevin, are you having fun? So much to look at, huh? In 2014, Andrea began attending the University of Maryland in College Park. She began to focus in on laboratory science, and planned to learn more about the blood disorder that had afflicted her. She wanted to learn not only the cause of it, but how to prevent it in others. Patricia Hankey, one of Andrea's friends, described her as her super smart sciencey friend. Quote, She fought for the pregnancy. She fought for her life afterwards. She fights for aplastic anemia. I think that's what motivates her to do so much in the biochemistry lab area. Eventually, the small de Gelder family moved back to the area of Augusta, Georgia. More specifically, the area of Grovetown, a small suburb on the outskirts of the Augusta metropolitan area. Located in neighboring Columbia County, Grovetown is an area that has exploded over the last two decades, due to the growth of Fort Gordon, a military base just south of Augusta. While Augusta itself is an older town, Grovetown has become one of the young upstarts in the surrounding area. Once a little more than a dirt town, Grovetown has grown up significantly in a very short period of time. Many military members sent to Fort Gordon have been drawn to Grovetown because of its cheap housing cost, and the fact that it does not carry with it many of the issues that Augusta has, namely, the economic decline from decades prior and the high crime rate. Some point to Grovetown as a town which has been completely gentrified over the past 15 or so years, and it's really hard to argue with them. However, a friend of mine, a native to this area, said that Grovetown wasn't much of a town before its takeover by military families, so there wasn't much to gentrify. So, I'll let you be the judge. Grovetown was in the beginning of its most recent popularity surge when the DeGelders moved back to the area. Andrea continued her education at the nearby Augusta University, eventually obtaining a graduate degree in clinical laboratory sciences. She even won the school's 2017 Excellence in Research Award for Allied Health. No easy feat. However, as Andrea's life had shown her thus far, every step forward was another step back. In June of 2017, after a 15-year-long marriage, 
Ryan DeGelder filed for divorce. The divorce was finalized four months later, and Andrea found herself single for the first time in nearly two decades. Following her divorce, Andrea de Gelder began to rebuild her life, piece by piece. She continued to live in Grovetown, moving to a small subdivision named Ivy Falls. Ivy Falls is about as suburban as it can get. Many brick houses, nearby a couple of small ponds with walking trails, and it is just down the road from a couple of local schools. Some homes literally even have the white picket fence. In the latter half of 2017, Andrea moved into a small home at 518 Great Falls, on the corners of Wichita Falls and Great Falls Roads. It is a small brick home, with a one-car garage and a small, fenced backyard. Neighbors say that she was just about as quiet a neighbor as you could hope for. Those that live in the neighborhood say that Andrea was quiet and kept to herself, with very few exceptions. She often stayed indoors when at home, only coming out for random spurts of yard work. Some of her neighbors recall only seeing her as she was leaving to or coming home from work, but others would see her come out from time to time to visit with her ex-husband when he was dropping off or picking up their son. These habits carried on for the last year or so, leading up to July of this year, 2018. Andrea went on a brief vacation in the middle of July, returning on the weekend of July 21st. When exactly she returned is up for debate, but she almost immediately resumed working, with at least one neighbor seeing her return from work on the morning of Tuesday, July 24th. For the past year or so, following her graduation from Augusta University, Andrea had been working as a medical technologist for the Charlie Norwood VA Medical Center over in downtown Augusta. More often than not, Andrea worked overnights between the hours of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So, as people left for work in the morning, Andrea was usually returning home and preparing for bed. On July 24th, 2018, a Tuesday, things proceeded as usual. Andrea's son, Kellen, now seven years old, was staying with his father, and Andrea, back from vacation, decided to cover a shift for her co-worker, Marsha. This shift at work went off without a hitch and Andrea left work at approximately 7 o'clock that Wednesday morning. She had apparently made dinner plans with a friend for later that evening, the 25th of July, but those plans had been cancelled. So it seems like Andrea had the afternoon and early evening to herself, last speaking to the friend in question at around 4.15pm. This would be Andrea's last known contact with any of her loved ones. On the evening of Wednesday, July 25th, Andrea de Gelder was scheduled to work at 11 p.m., but was a no-show. This was very unusual and out of the ordinary for Andrea, who was a very reliable and punctual person. At the very least, she would have called, as guaranteed by her friend and co-worker Marsha Maldonado, who stated, When I heard that she didn't call and didn't show up to work, immediately I was concerned because she just wouldn't have done that. Eventually, her co-workers at the Charlie Norwood VA Medical Center contacted a friend of hers, who made the effort to try and find out if something had happened. Naturally, one of the fears might have been related to Andrea's prior illnesses, but this friend of Andrea's tried calling her and made a house call to no avail. This friend then contacted authorities, hoping that they would be able to perform a welfare check on Andrea. It was later that day, Thursday, July 26th, 2018, that deputies with the Columbia County Sheriff's Office responded to the call of a welfare check. Upon no answer at the front door, deputies entered the home of Andrea de Gelder. There, they found a scene that raised many red flags. The front door to Andrea's home was locked, as were the other various windows and doors leading into the house. There seemed to be no damage to any entrance points, with there being no sign of forced entry. However, in addition to her garage being closed and locked, her car was still parked in the garage, indicating that she had not gone anywhere. However, deputies quickly discovered that Andrea was not in her home. A chaotic scene had been left behind, which pointed to some significant foul play. 
A responding deputy found blood along the walls and floor of the kitchen, as well as more blood leading down the hallway towards the master bedroom. There, there were more traces of blood found on some items of clothing, which were lying on the floor, as well as on the bed itself. In addition, several of the rooms inside the home seemed to be in a state of disarray. The contents of Andrea's purse were scattered across the kitchen floor, and the home seemed to be a far cry from the way Andrea usually kept things. It was clear that something violent had happened inside the home of Andrea de Gelder. Now, investigators had to figure out what had happened, and who was involved. That's after the break. The news of Andrea's disappearance broke on the Thursday that police responded to the wellness check, but it wasn't until the following day, Friday, July 27th, that more details were shared with the public. Police announced that they believed Andrea de Gelder had not just gone missing, but they publicly stated their belief that she had likely been taken against her will. Columbia County Sheriff's Major Steve Morris stated that, based on evidence collected, including no sign of forced entry, that investigators believed Andrea knew the person responsible. Quote, Based on what we discovered from the residents yesterday and today, we are confident she left unwillingly. We have a large group of investigators working on this case. They have conducted many interviews these past 24 hours, interviewed friends, family, co-workers, neighbors, and even persons of interest. Jim Zeiler, one of Andrea's neighbors, echoed what the investigators had told him and others in the community about the case. Quote, From what I understand, there was no sign of breaking in as far as the house is concerned. I mean, she opened her door to somebody who treated her poorly after she opened the door. I think it was someone who knew her personally and had a hell of a lot of hate in his heart for her. That Friday... July 27th saw the true beginning of the investigation to find Andrea de Gilder. Police removed boxes of potential evidence from Andrea's home throughout the day, and Andrea's vehicle was towed away from the scene for further examination. Police had already stated that they believed someone who knew Andrea was behind her suspicious disappearance, with the responsible party being a likely friend or acquaintance. A police official was even quoted as saying that this was a 99% possibility. As such, they began reaching out to everyone they could find that had some connection to Andrea, including associates from work, her friends and family, and those in the neighborhood. The most intriguing clue left behind at the scene was Andrea's pink iPhone 7, which had been left in her living room. It was locked behind a passcode, but at a simple examination, investigators could see that there were multiple notifications for unread text messages and emails as well as several missed calls from worried friends and co-workers. The Thursday that police entered Andrea's home and found the bloody, chaotic scene left behind, a search warrant was obtained to gain access to the phone's records and call logs. In particular, the phone records from the week prior, July 19th to July 26th. The language from this search warrant made it clear that police believed at least two crimes had been committed, including battery. It is unknown what kind of information police were able to glean from Andrea's iPhone, but investigators did publicly state that Andrea was active on a number of dating apps and sites, including Tinder, Bumble, and Plenty of Fish. Investigators floated this information, and made it clear that they were looking into those she communicated with through these apps as potential persons of interest. For many that lived in the community, this was an immediate cause for concern. You see, just weeks before Andrea had gone missing, a woman living in the same neighborhood as her, a single mother that lived in Ivy Falls, had met a man through Bumble. That man, a 37-year-old, had expressed some odd behaviors after going on a few dates with this mother. About a week before Andrea's disappearance, on July 19th, 37-year-old Mitchell McCracken was arrested on aggravated stalking charges. 
and the single mother at the heart of that story was now moving out of the area entirely. You may be wondering why I'm telling you this, but as someone who's been looking into the story as it unfolds, the investigative lead brought by dating apps has consumed a lot of the conversation regarding theories. In fact, when neighbors first heard about a woman going missing with a connection to a dating app, they believed it was this mother. And for the record, I am not accusing Mitchell McCracken, the 37-year-old man accused of aggravated stalking, of having any involvement in the disappearance of Andrea DeGelder. I just hope that this story fills you in on that aspect of the story, which has been covered extensively in the media's reporting on Andrea's disappearance. In addition to finding Andrea's phone in her living room, investigators have remained pretty confident that they were able to obtain DNA from inside the home. DNA, which they believe, may belong to a suspect or a person of interest. This DNA has been submitted to crime labs of both the Georgia and the Federal Bureaus of Investigation, but more on that later. Surveillance footage was also taken by authorities from some of the houses in Andrea's neighborhood. Police have stated that they were able to get footage from at least eight cameras nearby Andrea's home, including doorbell footage from one of her neighbors, which constantly monitors outdoor activity and movement. Following the disappearance of Andrea de Gelder, the community she lived in was on high alarm. As I've hinted at, this community is a very ho-hum suburban area. Things are quiet, with most families moving to the area in recent years, due to some involvement with the local military base. This subdivision, which is just down the road from the large and scenic Patriots Park, is also just a short walk away from the nearest elementary, middle, and high schools. No matter what time you go outside, even in the early morning hours or at sunset, you're bound to see at least one person walking around, making use of the walking trails nearby the area's ponds, or working on a vehicle or doing some yard work. Itiago Felton, one of Andrea's neighbors, told a local reporter that, Everybody is kind of nervous. I was at church yesterday, and people who don't live in this neighborhood, people who live in Tudor Branch, they're even nervous now. Just for reference, Tudor Branch is a housing development a couple of miles away. News of Andrea's disappearance was sending shockwaves throughout the entire community. Even there. Felton continued, stating, I have a 14-year-old, and I see a lot of young ladies walking around. Everybody walks in this neighborhood, but now, things have changed. That was a very valid point. It's not often that I pick up on social cues, but even I noticed the change in the community. The neighbors I usually saw on my morning walks were noticeably absent, and it took me a few days until I understood why. On Sunday, July 29th, just a few days after Andrea's disappearance, a group of volunteers hung up flyers throughout the area. It was a rainy, overcast, muggy day, but these volunteers persevered through the conditions, hanging up the missing persons posters that I would eventually stumble upon the following day. That Monday, July 30th, 2018, saw the publication of a letter from Donna Morrison, Andrea's mother. Quote, to the perpetrators who have taken my daughter, this is my plea to you, to please release her or return her to us, safe and sound. She has a young son who needs her. Her family is heartbroken that this has happened to her. We need to know why you would do this to our precious little girl. She fought long and hard to survive a potentially fatal condition, aplastic anemia, so that she could survive long enough to give birth to her son. She lived through all of that, and went on to get her master's degree in biology, so that she could research blood disorders like hers and help save lives. She is a research scientist, and her life is especially valuable for this reason, if not for the fact that she is loved by her family and friends. Please, please return her to us. Have mercy, please. The letter was then signed by Donna, as well as Andrea's stepfather, Weldon, her brother, Logan and her sister, Amy. On August 1st, 2018, a Wednesday, approximately a week after Andrea DeGelder disappeared from her Grovetown home, a press conference was scheduled by the Columbia County Sheriff's Office. That morning, the press conference was led by Major Sharif Chochol, who stood beside over a dozen other sheriff's officials. On Thursday, July 26th, we conducted a welfare check on Andrea Pauline Deckhelder at her residence located at 518 Great Falls in Ivy Falls subdivision. Inside the residence, we found evidence leading us to believe 
that Mrs. Daghelder was taking against her will. Late yesterday evening, the investigation led us to a dumpster that was located in the Gateway Shopping Center on Lewiston Road. Inside that dumpster, we found the body of a white female we believe to be Andrea Daghelder. The body has been sent to the crime lab for positive identification and an autopsy. The discovery was made through the collaborative efforts of many agencies and people, some of which you see around me. First off, all the men and women of the Columbia County Sheriff's Office, specifically those in the Investigations Division and Intelligence Unit who are gathered around me. They've worked tirelessly around the clock since discovering Mrs. Daghelder's disappearance. These investigators are the best there out there. Their old-fashioned old investigative know-how combined with high-tech investigative techniques involving technology and forensics has helped get us where we are today. We'd also acknowledge, like to acknowledge the help of the Federal Viewer Investigation, who is also present today, for their support and expertise since the discovery of Mrs. Deckheller missing. The Richmond County and Burke County Sheriff's Offices for their technical expertise and the forensic lab of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Additionally, I'd like to thank the Columbia County Emergency Management Agency, specifically Director, EMA Director Andy Lianza for his support from the beginning, Columbia County Fire Rescue, Columbia County Information Technology, Columbia County Waterworks and Fleet Services, our local media for helping us get the message out, and the residents of Ivy Falls who we've been canvassing the neighborhood since the time of her disappearance. This team will continue to do whatever it takes to solve this case, which is sadly no longer a missing persons case, but a homicide investigation. We ask anyone with information to contact us, and as always, we'll share any information we can with the public and the news media. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions about the details of this case. However, however many we can simply not answer to ensure the integrity of the investigation and the subsequent prosecution. Although we believe we've located Mrs. Deckhelder, our work is not done. It's obvious the suspect tried to clean up and cover up the crime scene, but it didn't work. We have pictures, surveillance video, physical evidence to include DNA and our team of investigators will continue to work to, respond, to identify the person or persons responsible for this crime. Thank you. We can try to take a couple questions if you have them, but. Do you, do you guys have a person of interest as of now? We are chasing down leads, but I cannot identify at this time a person of interest. We have been interviewing numerous people. We're interviewing friends, we're interviewing family, we're interviewing any kind of acquaintances, acquaintances she's got. Um, so we're doing a lot of interviews and not ready to identify anyone as a suspect. Can you tell us what led you to the dumpster? We can't get into the details, but like I said, good old fashioned police work and um, high tech um, investigative ability. can't get into that. Again, we don't want to hurt the integrity of the case or the prosecution later down the road. Can you go into further about what the house, where you found inside the house? Okay, the house? can't do that. We don't want to, again, we don't want to hurt the integrity of the case, but it was obvious to us that an abduction had occurred and that the, the person responsible tried to clean up the crime scene. And again, it didn't work. Have you alerted the family? What took you, I guess, so long to the, the family has been notified of where we, we are in the investigation. Um, so yes, ma'am, they have been notified. And you do believe that the murder took place inside the house? We do believe so. Based on what we found inside the residence and at the, at the scene, we believe that the murder occurred inside the residence. 
we have we have um, brought the dumpster to our our location to be processed and are currently processing the evidence there. So the dumpster the dumpster where you found the body is not there anymore. Right. We located the dumpster in the Gateway Shopping Center and had it removed from the Gateway Shopping Center to the sheriff's office to be processed for evidence. And surveillance video of the neighbors um, did that show you guys anything? I'm not going to get into the details, but we've got a lot of surveillance video um, throughout, whether it's from the neighborhood or outside the neighborhood. There's a lot of surveillance video that these men and women have been combing through since the day of, that we learned of her missing. And do you have a timeline, like when this could have happened? Any idea of what time uh, this happened? We don't want to get in, in too specific of the details um, on that, no ma'am. We won't know for sure, depending, yeah, that'll be pending the autopsy results when we get those. All right. Thank y'all. After Major Chochol was finished speaking, Columbia County Sheriff Clay Whittle, who had been standing towards the back of the room near reporters, stepped forward. While pointing at the investigators and police officials who had been conducting the investigation, Sheriff Whittle gave accolades while answering a few more questions. Because this is what helped bring this case to where it is now. The men and women of the sheriff's office, in particular our CID and our intelligence unit, has literally worked 24 hours a day for the last seven days. If you were to come up here at 3 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, these people were here. They were working. There's a couple of individuals here that are with our local Federal Bureau of Investigation, they have been doing the exact same thing. When this happened from the very beginning, they were on scene with us. They offered every assistance they possibly could, and it was extremely valuable to our investigators, some of the things that the FBI has been doing for us. They, they know what they're doing. They've been doing it for years, and they're very good at it. And, and again, they offered us that assistance. The Richmond County Sheriff's Office immediately offered us assistance. The Burke County Sheriff's Office immediately offered assistance to our team here. It's that collaborative effort, internal departments here in Columbia County that Major Chocho told you about, our, our water utility, our, our information technology group, our fleet services group, numerous agencies, our fire department assisted us. Of course, our new director for EMA, Andy Leanza, was a wealth of information and, and equipment for us to, to work this long-term crime scene. It, it's this collaboration that I want you to know about and I want the public to know about more than anything else here. There's going to be plenty of information to come forward after this because this investigation is just now really rolling. Now that we have our missing person, forensics are being done. Forensics that we have to include DNA evidence is being processed as we speak. And that's just going to bring this to a conclusion somewhere down the road. We're going to catch this suspect, there's no doubt in my mind. The hard work of all these individuals, all the people in the county and the surrounding agencies that have helped us is going to assure that that's taking place. I also want to make sure we make special mention to all of the residents in Ivy Falls. This quite naturally was a shock to that neighborhood, as it would be to any neighborhood. But the neighborhood didn't stop at what we told them. They rolled their sleeves up and they went to work trying to help us. They made flyers. They were talking to individual neighbors. They were talking to friends that had been in the neighborhood. They assisted us also, and you'll see some of that when it comes prosecution time. It, it, this truly is a collaborative effort. I'm proud of Columbia County. I'm proud of these other agencies that have helped us today. And I really want us to, when we walk away today, I want everybody to understand how grateful we are that this assistance has been brought to us. Otherwise, we may still be working this investigation and not have discovered her. But I will tell you, the hard work of these men and women, what I call old-fashioned shoe leather, coupled with new technology, is what's brought this case to where it is now. And, and it's just gonna go forward from here. I, there's no doubt that through the assistance of folks like the FBI, our forensics lab in Atlanta, GBI, places like that are, are, are hard working right now for this case and they'll help us bring a conclusion to it. I just want to make sure that you recognize how hard these people have worked for the last week and the cooperation that we've received from all of them to include the neighborhood at Ivy Falls and we appreciate that. 
Thank you. One more question for you. Do you still believe that this is someone that killed in you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We don't believe that this is a, 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 an unknown assailant. We believe that there's a connection here. And are, can you guys go on record saying? One more. This is the last one. Um, can you go on record saying anything about the dating apps and know that that was that she's been on a lot of dating apps? No. Thank you. It was believed that a body found behind a local shopping center was that of Andrea Pauline de Gelder. The Gateway Shopping Center, where this body was found, was a little under four miles away from Andrea's home. The shopping center, which is just off of Interstate 20, is a busy area with a lot of traffic throughout the day and night. After all, the shopping center contains multiple shops, including a large Walmart, which is open 24 hours a day. The body, which police believed was Andrea de Gelder, had been found in a recycling dumpster behind this Walmart. More specifically, the dumpster was behind a neighboring pet store where there were no cameras present. In fact, this entire area behind the stores was devoid of any cameras, making the identity of the person who dumped Andrea's body a total mystery. Police announced that the body was being sent for an autopsy to determine the identity and the cause of death but police felt confident enough to change the status of Andrea's case from a missing person's case to a homicide. And in addition to the body being sent to a nearby GBI lab for examination, the dumpster was also seized and sent off for an examination of its own. Investigators now had a lot of evidence to work and sift through, but they remained confident that they had all the clues needed to solve this case. Columbia County Sheriff's Major Sharif Chochol, who led the press conference, told reporters who asked about a potential timeline for the case to be solved. Processing the crime scene, it's obvious that whoever's responsible tried to clean up the scene, but it didn't work. We have evidence to include DNA evidence, pictures, surveillance video, so we've got a lot of evidence um, that we are going through. We don't think it's a matter of if, we just think it's a matter of when. Major Chochol also told reporters in an ominous statement aimed at the responsible party. We would encourage that person to come turn themselves in before we have to track them down. On Thursday, August 2nd, Major Steve Morris with the Columbia County Sheriff's Office confirmed that the identity of the body was none other than Andrea Pauline de Gelder. He also stated that she was identified via fingerprints, which police were able to obtain through a records request. Vernon Collins, the Columbia County Coroner, conducted the autopsy of the body and confirmed Andrea's cause of death as strangulation. Collins, the coroner, also stated that due to the decomposition of the body, that it was possible that Andrea had been in that dumpster for close to a week. Perhaps she had even been left there shortly after she went missing, on July 25th. This was hard to verify because, as I said, the area behind the Gateway Shopping Center had no security cameras. Just the fact that Andrea had been killed was enough to shatter the spirits of those that knew her. But the idea of her being left in a dumpster for close to a week... That was too much to bear for those that loved Andrea. This included Marsha Maldonado, her co-worker and friend, whose shift Andrea had covered on the Tuesday before her disappearance. Quote, That's what I keep thinking about, that she was just discarded like a piece of trash. And I think that's just hard to imagine. You just want to hug her and take care of her and say it's going to be okay. Following the news that Andrea's case had turned from a missing person story to a homicide, signs began to pop up around the community. Hashtag Justice for Andrea signs began to crop up throughout the neighborhood, and a plethora of the signs continued to litter Andrea's front yard. 
On August 3rd, 2018, a Friday, the family of Andrea arrived in Grovetown and were in attendance at a vigil in Andrea's front yard, which had been put together by other loved ones. During the vigil, the press were allowed to come, but they were asked to keep a sincere distance and not to pester grieving loved ones during the ceremony. A poem was read by one of Andrea's friends, while another led the group in prayer just moments later. This prayer asked for healing, as well as requesting God's assistance in helping the investigators obtain justice for Andrea and a life lost too soon. This prayer also included a small mention for Andrea's neighbors, whose illusion of safety had been forcefully, and perhaps irrevocably, shattered. At the end of this small gathering, a pair of balloons, one pink and one red, were lifted off into the evening sky. A local church had donated a collection of candles to the vigil's organizers, and a candlelight vigil was held later that evening, which brought together many more of Andrea's loved ones in solemn remembrance of her life. About a week later, Andrea's older sister, Amy DeGarmo Bowen, spoke to local news station WRDW News 12, stating about her beloved younger sibling, quote, we need something to make us feel like her life wasn't a waste and a homicide. It's terrible. She was important to us, and she's leaving behind people that need those answers, need peace. Our day-to-day -day functioning is just a mess. We need justice. I mean, we'll lay her to rest, yes, and we'll have a place to go and grieve, but we don't have any peace in our hearts. Andrea Pauline de Gelder, formerly known as Andrea Pauline de Garmo, was laid to rest on Saturday, August 18th, 2018. She was buried in her hometown of Salisbury, Missouri, with her funeral taking place at the Salisbury Funeral Home. At the time of her death, she was just 39 years old. Columbia County officials remain confident that this case will wrap up pretty quickly. They have obtained cooperation from the FBI and the GBI, and remain hopeful that the suspect will come forward in due time. They have stated repeatedly that evidence, via DNA found at the crime scene, has been submitted to the GBI crime lab. Investigators are awaiting results from this DNA testing, remaining cautiously optimistic that the results will come back in just weeks. However, some remain more pessimistic about that likelihood. Austin Rhodes, an Augusta-based radio host and correspondent for Metro Spirit, wrote an article detailing the inefficiencies of Georgia's crime labs. One of his most recent articles, titled Christmas May Arrive Before Crime Lab Results Are in Hand, goes on to highlight how underfunded and understaffed Georgia's testing facilities are. With the backlog for Columbia County investigators totaling 14 cases, dating back to April of this year, 2018. Neighboring Richmond County, which has a much higher crime rate, has 40 cases in this testing backlog, dating back to March. Andrea's cause of death was determined at her initial autopsy, but more thorough testing will likely take months. The estimate by Austin Rhodes, that Christmas may come before the results from her test arrive, isn't too outlandish of an estimate. Some remain more optimistic that the truth will present itself before long. On August 21st, 2018, just days ago, for some of you listening to this, investigators began searching the home of one of Andrea's neighbors. Local journalists and cameramen staked out in the neighborhood, filming the location past 11 p.m., while police investigators sporadically carried out boxes and bags of evidence. The home, which is directly next to Andrea's house, belongs to a 55-year-old man named Christopher Gibson. Gibson has been named a person of interest in Andrea's case, and he has a long and storied history of various crimes including shoplifting and obstructing a law enforcement officer. Most recently, he was arrested again for shoplifting in May of this year, 2018, although the location varies. Some publications report that he was arrested at a Dollar General, and others report that he was arrested at a Walmart. This would be a noteworthy difference because there is a Dollar General just down the street, 
at the entrance to the Ivy Falls community both Andrea and he lived in. However, the closest Walmart would be the one where Andrea's body was found, potentially tying him to that location. And, as of just a few months ago, Gibson has reportedly been in legal trouble for alleged harassment and stalking of an 18-year-old girl, who just so happens to live in the same neighborhood as him, but that is nothing more than an allegation at this point. I just want to point out that he has not been charged in that incident. Christopher Gibson is currently in the Columbia County Detention Center, awaiting trial for his shoplifting charge. Citing his past, the judge presiding over his case has denied him bond. As of this moment, he has been labeled a person of interest in the disappearance of Andrea de Gelder, but I will keep you all informed as I learn more. Throughout every episode of this podcast, I try to keep myself out of it as much as possible. After all, this story is not about me. This pain, this sorrow, this anguish, it's not mine. It does not belong to me, and I don't get to claim any of it. The story you have heard today is that of Andrea de Gelder, a 39-year-old mother, sister, daughter, colleague, neighbor, and friend to many. The only reason I included the introduction of this episode the long, drawn-out story of me finding her missing persons poster, that whole spiel, is because I wanted it to serve as a reminder. A reminder that these stories are real. The stories I cover on Unresolved, mostly, are true tales, which revolve around real people. Despite whatever storytelling flair I may put behind certain aspects, the story you have heard is an ongoing saga of grief and tragedy, and I only ever try to include my perspective to make that really sink in. I feel like a lot of times, the true crime genre tends to forget that. I'm no exception to that critique. I try to keep that in focus throughout the podcast, but even I lose sight of that at times. Stories like this though, just remind me how real all of this is. I often talk about people I've never met, and discuss places I've never been to, but the setting of this story is my everyday life. It's the world I live in. Despite never meeting her, Andrea de Gelder lived just blocks away from me. The setting of this investigation is a reminder that these stories don't happen in a vacuum. They happen every day, to people just like you and me. I would like that to be the note I end on, as I wrap up this season of Unresolved. That these stories are real, and there are always real-world ramifications. Yeah, it can be cool and interesting to learn about how a criminal investigation unfolded, and it can be intriguing to learn all of the gory details. But just remember, at the end of the day, there are real people on the other side of this podcast who are still hurting with the loss of Andrea de Gelder. All of the people that knew her, that loved her, now have a gap in their lives where she once was. Please try to remember that. And, if you can, keep her loved ones in your thoughts. If you know anything about this case, please contact the Columbia County Sheriff's Office. They can be phoned at 706-541-2800. I hope to have an update for this case soon, but until then, the story of Andrea Pauline de Gelder remains unresolved. Thank you for listening to Unresolved. 
As you may now be aware, this is the final episode of the third season of Unresolved, which has been its longest and busiest season yet. Don't worry though, as I said before, I treat the idea of seasons quote unquote pretty loosely. And I'll be back in just a few weeks with another batch of new episodes. Just taking a small breather to catch up on the things I've missed over the last couple of months and to do a little bit of traveling. I have a friend's wedding on the west coast in just a couple of weeks, and I'm going to be visiting with some family and friends that I have not seen in a couple of years. I'll also be taking some time to work on Hoax, my other podcast, which will be coming back for an extended season 2 this fall, so that's something to look forward to. I won't bore you with any business stuff this go around, but if you need to get a hold of me, you could do so by searching for Unresolved on social media, or by visiting our website, unresolved.me. I have a large amount of messages and emails from this summer to catch up on, so if you've been waiting on those, I'm sorry. I've just been overly busy. But I'll hopefully be catching up over the next couple of weeks. Also, if you cannot go without an unresolved fix for the foreseeable future, make sure to become a patron on Patreon. I will be posting another bonus episode during my absence, which you will not want to miss out on. I may even post a second short one about a murderous crocodile named Gustav, just for shits and giggles. However, I bid you all adieu for the time being. Until I return, stay safe, and I will talk to you all later.